All right. So. How's everybody doing? Tired. What? It was a long night last night. Why? Celebrate. What do you celebrate? Dear friends, twenty first. Oh, good. Maybe on Kevin. Is Kevin okay? He'll be here. Logan, Bobby, Justine, Mackenzie. I was sits in the same seat, making it very easy for me. Lyle, groups around here, Lyle. Oh, yeah, right? It's, he writes in such a dramatic way. It's like I know, it's so weird. Yeah. No offense, Dave. Joe, Quincy, Quincy, Mitchell, Ryan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ryan. Okay. Sarah. Sarah's not clear. <laughs> It's okay. Oh. It's okay. It's over. I mean, I got COVID, so I don't know. I don't need to get tested. Not now, like two weeks. Yeah. Me too. I mean, two months. <laughs> April. Yeah, it's two months. Yeah, they say don't test. Yeah. I'm clear. So maybe they want us to report symptoms down here. Try that. Yeah, they don't want me reports. Yes. Um, the expectations for the editors is like everyone else, uh, offer us, like it wouldn't be crazy for the two editors to uh, take responsibility, uh, one one reading each. Yeah, that's how it's That's what we do. Okay. So I would like question of one, like the three, four, So the expectation is that, um, you would, whatever reading you worked on, you write a takeaway for that entire reading. Um, what was the second thing we asked for in the bright space? Target. target questions. Is it target questions from the reading? Yes. For the reading? For the lecture. No, for the lecture, right? We changed it. He did that thing where he had, had, had us, he asked us to do this thing last week, and then he changed it, right? I hate it when he does that, but he did that, right? So it's the target questions coming out of the reading, heading into the lecture. Question, does that make sense? Did you get that? Coming out of the reading. like. Before, what we used to do is before we get into the reading, we say, okay, what do I want to get out of this reading? Like, why am I going to read this? Like, why should I bother reading this? What is, what is it going to do for me? Well, it had better explain to me something like, why does Los Angeles matter uh, to my practice? Uh, if this reading is talking about its influence on a foreign setting, why do I care about that? Right. That's so. That's an appropriate target question 
before you do the loop. But here we are. It's Tuesday night. I've done the reading. You know, not only have I done uh, the reading, I was the editor of this whole reading. And I don't have, I, why do you care? Why would I give you the target questions I had before I did the reading? It's kind of a, a empty, uh, it's an empty exercise. I, this, how's that supposed to help me? It's too late for me to give you the target questions I had before I did the reading. I've done the reading. So I don't want your stale old false target questions as if you haven't done the reading yet. You've already done the reading. What is going to help us succeed in this life? What's going to help us is I've done the reading. Let's acknowledge the fact that I've done the reading. I've done the readings. Well, I haven't read, you know, I did my part of it. I made my contribution to the group effort. But then I looked at the sketch writing for this reading. I looked at it enough to formulate my own takeaway sentence for that reading. So now that I've done that, I have some burning hot questions moving forward out of the reading and into the lecture it's because it's a new day today and I have to put down the phone so I can do the hand gesture, right? Before we go into this lecture, it's like this lecture had better answer these questions or else I'm gonna complain that my tuition dollars are not, right? So what are the target questions coming out of the reading? Is that Kevin? Okay. It's the noisiest door. Out of the reading and into the lecture. Is that clear? We don't, sorry, no offense. We don't care about your target questions that you had coming into the reading. That ship has sailed. The target questions coming into the reading is what help us engage the reading in a targeted way. So we don't get, we don't wander off into the weeds and get distracted and end up spending three or four hours, God forbid, on the sketch writing, right? Um, we want the target questions coming out of the reading, going into the lecture. And I'm gonna ask you what your target questions are momentarily. Okay, what was the third thing? The bibliography. What is the proper bibliography? Uh, we shouldn't be looking at this. What's the next thing? The footnote citation? Are they, is it different? Note citation. I, we call it a note citation because sometimes the note is at the foot, sometimes the note is at the end. But whether it's a foot note citation or an end note citation, it's a note citation. And when we put it under the uh, image in the caption, it's an image source uh, formatted according to the note citation standard. Okay. So um, the target questions for your for the last group as we entered into uh, the lecture period was uh, first one was about the analysis assignment, sec because you have another analysis assignment coming up. Right? It's due on Saturday because this is a regular old week. Um, so get ready for that. What do you feel you need to know in order to be successful in the analysis assignment that's due on Saturday? By the way, there were grades published for you yesterday. Um, you should look at that because um, fair game in these target questions. Why did I get that score? And what does that even mean? Your feedback, what does that even mean? How am I supposed to, how's that supposed to help me? That's a reasonable target question about the analysis because your job is to do better next week than you did last week. 
And by the way, we're expanding the requirements for the analysis. Now you have to do the full uh, caption. So a fair question is, how am I supposed to succeed with the caption? Your instructions are just not clear, right? That's fair game. Then the next set of target questions have to do with the sketch writer. So let's, uh, and then there were other target questions. We'll get into that soon, but let's, what are your questions specifically about the analysis? And maybe it's useful to look at the analysis assignment. So here's week eight's analysis assignment. It looks quite familiar. It's got one additional thing. Referring to page three of the analysis assignment linked here for your convenience, you're welcome. Provide all eight elements of the caption, citation in the footnote and the image source in the caption must comply with the proper Chicago Manual of Style note citation format. Questions? The only thing we are, we're not asking you to do on the full analysis assignment, we're still saying you don't have to do a video this week. Who's eager to do a video? No, you're not. You guys are intimidated by the video? I'm doing the first uh, the first assignment I did one. You did one, right? How hard was it? Not hard. Not hard, right? So you'll help everyone get over that fear. Yes. Um, it says eight elements of caption. Yes. Only the image Let's take a look at page three of the analysis assignment and see what madness is this eight elements of the caption. The eight elements of the caption color coded for your convenience are concisely capture the main idea of the claim supported by the visual evidence. There it is in blue. You've already been doing that, right? That's easy. I do that already. Right? Let's jump to number eight. Cite the source of your image, is what that should say, of your analysis image using note citation format. I already do that too. That's not new. So two of these eight elements, I already do. Right? I'm already good at that, right? Everyone's... Everyone's already good at those two? Everything's clear? Okay. So what are these other, what's two through seven? Characterize the view. And most of your views are gonna be aerial views. So you could just say aerial view of the, because this is constructed as if it's a sentence. This is not a proper sentence, it's a fragment of a sentence. Notice this is not a real sentence. It's not the claim. It's even shorter than the full sentence of the claim. It's just a fragment. It's not a real sentence. I forgive you. You're exempted from writing the proper sentence. Some would say then that shouldn't be a period, it should be a comma, whatever. Let's just make it a period for now. So that's the standards of publication of our profession. So characterize the view. That's number two. Number three, assign a date, probably a year. And it's a year that is somehow significant to the issue that you're dealing with. This is the year 1236 when the mosque was converted to a cathedral, I think. I think that's why that was chosen. So that's uh, the date. Number four, identify the work that is being shown. It's the great mosque slash cathedral. Number five, give it a place, Cordoba. We generally think of Cordoba being in Spain. If it's instead Cordoba, Illinois, then we would have to write Illinois. I think there's some clue. Um, it's like Berlin, New Hampshire. You know Berlin? 
Well, Berlin is in Germany, but if you're talking about Berlin, spelled the same as Berlin, you'd have to say Berlin, New Hampshire. So sometimes we just say Cordoba. Sometimes we say Cordoba, Illinois. But we would never say Cordoba, Spain. And we would say Berlin, if it's the one in Germany. Or we would say Berlin, New Hampshire, if it's the one in New Hampshire. Just like in the example given here is New York. We don't say New York, New York. We know New York. But if it's Montpellier, France, if we said Montpelier, that's Brooklyn, Vermont. Given our audience, we know where Montpelier is. It's in Vermont. It's the capital of Vermont. But we don't mean that Montpelier. We mean the one in France. So that's when we give the nation. You don't always give the nation. Okay. Then we attribute the creator of the work shown and the patron who commissioned it, if known. But oh, wait, where's that? That's missing. Do you lose, does the will lose points on this? No. We generally don't know who the architect of the cathedral was, and we don't know who it was for. Um, it's, we could go into the library and dig for months and years, and we identify the name of a few architects who worked on it at different times, and then the first cardinal. Of Cordoba, you know, so and so, but we don't need all that. Friends don't. Friends go that deep. It's not readily knowable, so we just leave that out. So okay, am I going to lose points if I don't have all eight points? If you might, if it's a work by Renzo Piano, you're going to lose points if you don't say by Renzo Piano. If it's um, for uh, if it's for the, you know, if it's for an important client, if the client of the project is an important factor in understanding, like Jonas Salk from the Salk Institute by Louis, Louis, Louis Kahn, it's important that it's for Jonas Salk, the inventor, the discoverer of the polio vaccine. Right? So that sometimes you would lose points if you don't put the patron or client's name. But often you don't. So it's a judgment call that we make in composition of our captions. Then claim the rights of your analysis drawing by adding your name in parentheses. Um, we've kind of adapted a new standard that acknowledges uh, the property rights of the Institute. Um, so that's probably the right thing to do. Document on the drive, right? Aren't like accessible by us? Yeah, you've been looking at it, right? Right, right oh, now. It's just never mind. Right now, uh, Alex and Jared are looking. But jo Johanna and Alex are looking at it. It's it's linked uh, in the assignment. If you just click on that link, it'll take you here. So. Um, well, wait, Bill Allen didn't take that photograph. Why is he claiming intellectual property rights for that photograph? He's not. Will Allen and you are claiming the intellectual property rights of the analysis. This is a derivative work. It is it derived, it is derived from and out of the original photograph, but the actual outcome of that work is the intellectual property of Will Allen with joint ownership by the one with Institute of Technology. Um, the image itself, when I want to find this image as one of the readers of the thing that you are publishing, I need to be able to go to this, this, this image source should allow me to get to that source image. And because uh, if your overlays are too opaque, 
and I need to see the original image in order to access uh, the data and make my own judgment uh, of whether you're interpreting it correctly or not. I need to be able to go there. And does anyone ever do that? Yes, we do. I sometimes open your source image and look at the original in order to figure out whether your interpretation is justified. So is this a useful tool of the profession? Yes. Yes, it is. Questions about the eight elements? One thing that sort of confused me about uh, number eight. Mm -hmm. In my case, I took uh, the picture I got was from an article. So I still didn't have to try the thing with the original photographer. That's okay. It's you're not credit. So it's interesting. The only credit is you. You're claiming the rights to this image. Beyond that, you are saying this is the source of the image. You're actually not uh, passing along the rights. And in my conversations with the Library of Congress, and yes, I am in touch with the Library of Congress on these issues for some crazy reason. Um, we haven't settled this yet, but this is where we're at. State of publication of the architectural profession. This is our standard. It may change. It has to do with uh, the fair use clause of the 1992 um, Copyright Act of the US Congress. Um, I, I know way more about this than I ever wanted to know, but this is where we're at. As a profession, is that like jury duty? It's more fun than jury duty, actually, because I got into this because of my own curiosity. I volunteered to figure out some legal issues for this organization that's publishing stuff globally. And so I kept digging until I had to meet with the Library of Congress people. This is where we're at. As best I can figure out this morning. Okay. Other questions about the eight things? Other questions about the analysis assignment as currently given? All this is when you when you look at this in preparation for your submission on Saturday, it's all going to make sense. Okay. It's making more and more sense, I hope. Now, how about the feedback from your first of all the grade, the use of the rubric, score, comments? What did I mean when I wrote that? Questions like that? Nothing? Okay, let's go to sketch writing. You just uh, completed a sketch writing assignment. These were the instructions. Did it all make sense? Easy? Routine? Increasingly routine? Like what if what if we don't agree with some of your comments? Then that's a useful question. Okay. Right. Yeah. Let's go back to analysis. You're saying there's some rooftop terrace in the foreground still, but there what? Like, to my knowledge, it's not. Let's look at it. What I highlighted was specifically rooftop circulation space. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. Now, as we dig in, as we navigate our way into your analysis submission, mm -hmm. 
we're running the risk of showing people your grade, okay. even if momentarily. That's okay. Are you okay? Yes. Okay. So it says the rooftop terrace in the foreground that has, has, has not been highlighted. Correct, but that's because it's not circulation space. I can't see a clear way to get up to those surfaces to use them as circulation. In other oh, to use as circulation. That's yeah, a good point. Analysis says so you're clarifying. I think. Yeah, I am, I, am I referring to. Stair well, is this a roof terrace or is that on the ground? That's in the ground, but I also on the 9.2 because you said that I did re highlight that stairwell, but the comment remains. You, which stairwell you, did you highlight? The one on the left there. Yeah, but yeah, that one that you just pointed out. No, this. Yeah, that one. I is highlighted. it highlighted? Well, and this is nine. This is nine. In 9.2, I highlighted it. Oh, good point. I did change some of the. Highlights on the courtyards too, because you also made a note that said there's extra courtyards, and I did guess I see one in the background, so I highlighted that. No great information is being shared. It was there for a second. Okay, yes, the, the circulation space up to that roof terrace is being highlighted. I guess, I think what I was referring to, um, this, it's not a roof terrace. Mm -hmm. Man, it seems relevant, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess, but I, I didn't focus on that. I yeah. focused on different things. Okay. So, fair enough. So, um, I'll take a look at that. Anything else like that in the analysis? Okay. Let's move on to sketch writing. Um, so here's that sketch writing we did. So um, one of the questions um, that we addressed, we got into the question, what is the difference between the bibliography format and the note citation? And do we care? Do you good? But you guys are all clear on it. And you know why we care. If you're all clear and you know why we care, then I'll just keep moving. Hmm? It's just adding information. You know? Um, the bibliography. The, the, the useful way to remember this is the bibliography is an alphabetized list of sources. And it doesn't make sense to alphabetize the list of sources according to the first name. That's crazy. So we alphabetize the list of sources according to the last name of the first one. And each item in the bibliography is separate from each other item by a period. So this is the two main differences. The bibliography performs a very specific function in the publication. It's a different function than this. And so it has to take a different form than the note citation. Are we good? So for 
Say that again. The floor is so loud that it's deafening. At the other room, we have. You know, we're kind of doing this to try to consolidate our confidence and our ability to just do it as a habit. So for now, yes. But ultimately, I want you to just do it perfectly every time. And I never want to talk to you about it. That's my goal. That's the goal of the profession. The profession wants you to just do it perfectly every time and never talk about it. And that's how I taught the class previously. I refused to teach this. I just required you to do it right. And I would just say, nope, wrong. Send you on your way. Figure it out for yourself. In part because by going into this, we can't go into the architecture part. So at the eight o'clock class, we only did, we had 25 minutes for the lecture because we spent so much time doing this. And I videotaped it. So if you want a bigger discussion of all of these things, I'll make that video of eight o'clock available to you. Can you go to the top? Um, to like the, yeah, this. Um, were we expected to do Obviously, yeah, there was just a door takeaway for the whole chapter that we read. That's in the Brightspace submission. Yes. Yeah. So we didn't have to do a takeaway for our own individual like chunk of reading. What we like is whenever there's a main heading section, it's nice to have a takeaway. Okay. Because your future self, I don't want to have time to go into everything. I want just tell me, former self, just tell me what I need to know 20 years later. Right? Just tell me in one sentence what this section is about. Tell me in one sentence what this entire chapter is about. Please, I don't have, I don't have time to read all this. So it's your reading section It's a judgment call. I mean, I want you guys to take ownership of this. So I'm a little uncomfortable I mean, this is the product of years and years of your predecessors figuring out what works for them. Um, and so I'm just sharing the outcome of that and encouraging you to take ownership and say, uh, what if instead of doing this, we do that and you make it work better for you guys? Um, Riley had a question. Um, I had a question about the takeaway. So you said takeaway. Here in the actual writing versus the submission. We have to put our submission takeaway into our editor. No. Okay. So no. The editors are taking care of that. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Andrews. Um I saw like the other were asking if like each subsection works cited. Is that necessary for all of us to keep that? Like basically the same footnote or like no citation for each page, basically. Or can it just um show me, take me to where you're talking about? Um, for instance, on the hours, which is uh, page twenty one. Yeah. Why are there twenty one pages? Oh my god, terrifying. A lot of it is page breaks. Okay, I hope so. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so we have a page range of like five pages. Mm -hmm. What would you have wanted us to like put a footnote or a unit of citation for in every page, like at least the one we read? No. So it could be the whole chapter six. For example, this. Um, is that not necessary? Or is it's that not necessary. The whole sketch writing has all these uh, page locations throughout in order. So when I'm, you know, when I'm, when you're writing something, you don't have time to go find the book and look up what page that thing was on. So you can do a proper note citation. So that's why you have page locations all over the place, right? Crazy num. There's page locations just in an insane 
uh, many times, right? Every line says page 234, still on page 234. This is also on page 234. It's like, God, can you stop giving me the page location? No, we need the page location so that we can confidently write uh, our note citations in the future without having the book in our hands and having to look it up, right? So um, we don't need these footnotes. Does that make sense? Do we all agree? We don't need those footnotes? Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, other questions about this? Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. Also, I think, I mean, just looking at the whole document, there seems to be a lot of different formatting uh, when it comes to like paraphrasing versus a question. Mm -hmm. Can we just like, what is like the way you want it to be? Is it like this where it's, of course, paraphrasing is not in brackets, but then the question or like speculations are bracketed and also um, indented. This is probably a better way. Smaller blocks. Smaller blocks of text because my future self uh, is easily overwhelmed. Uh, my future self doesn't have time to read these huge blocks of text. My future self is looking for basically a, a, a diagram of the content so I don't have to read it too much. I can just scan through it, quickly identify the chunk that I need right now, and grab it. And so I want to do this in chunks, and I want to give page location for every chunk. I'm not sure this is right, but this is the kind of thing we want. And it wouldn't be crazy um, to have uh, this interspersed with uh, chunks like this. that uh, So this is about information my this is my questioning connecting speculating on the topic of information technique. So it goes with that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, the outline is not a separate section. The highlighting is not a separate section. The keywords are not a separate section. It's all integrated. Paraphrase, 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 my engagement, paraphrase, my engagement. Keyword, keyword, um, keyword. And then we expect highlighting the message here is that the authors of this sketch writing do not consider anything here to be so important that you might consider it as an ingredient to be included in the one sentence statement. There's really nothing important. I think we take that highlight Yeah, that's left over from the limitations of hypothesis. Oh, it is. Yeah, so hypothesis, Thank you very much, and I thank you. Now we have the full expressive uh, potential of bolding key terms, highlighting key ideas. The key ideas that might be important enough to incorporate into a one sentence statement. So your future self can go through here and uh, just say, okay, what's important? Supportive roles of geodemographics, whatever that means, that's important. What else is important? Group 12 is important. No, that's not important. 
That was a uh, question or your response to the side. It's not. Oh, okay. All right. Benefiting only those who are deemed financially worthy. That's important. That's a key term and a key concept. Shared facilities should be affordable. That's important. Cross subsidies is a key term. So in the in my future self, I'm in a meeting and we're talking, my team is my team and I, we're talking about um, we're working on a development uh, and it's important to trying to capture the identity of the community. We want people to feel at home in the community center where we're designing housing the lines here in the library and the school. And so we want people to feel at home, um, but we don't want to put this superficial art piece kind of false in, we don't want to create a sign of I want to be able to use this term that I got from this reading. But I can't really what's the sign of it. It feels like a useful idea, but I'm not confident enough about what it means to use it. So who can find sign of in the sketch writing? You know, this is it's 15 years from now, you're in a meeting, you want to use the term. What do you do? You do a uh, you do a search. Let's try it. This is a test. This is a let's try it. Simulacra. Uh, and remember, it had to do with this. Didn't work. I was hoping that it would take us here. I think the issue is that like Simulacra is more like a like kind of access to an authority device. So like it's not like specific enough for people to be able to kind of show So Say that the last part? Like it it like the term simulacra is like big enough that it's it kind of acts more like a cultural device or like a Okay, and this doesn't seem to have registered. Our website has not yet registered with Google. I'm a little disappointed. But hopefully 15 years from now, when you're in a meeting and you need to refresh your memory of what the term simulacra means, Yeah. The author uses the word simulacra defined as an artifact that claims to be an authentic reproduction, even if the authenticity is very much lacking. Okay. Uh, thank you, former self, for doing a good job with the sketch writing. I can now address my, my group and use the term simulacra, saying, you know, here's, here's a context in which one of you can use this 15 years from now. Yes, we want the people uh, of the community to feel at home in this uh, daycare center without, uh, without uh, inadvertently producing this caricature of their identity without creating a simulacra as if it's a Disneyland version of who they are. Boom, right? And notice how there was enough multiple ways of explaining the same thing that no one is feeling stupid because they don't know what the word simulacra means. That's what we do as professionals. We try to prevent, you know, we actually enrich people's experience by the way we use simulacra in parallel with uh, superficial Disneyland theme park. You know, so you don't, the caricature, 
right? You don't have to understand the word simulacra uh, to embrace the statement that you made there in that meeting 15 years ago. That's how this is supposed to work. But when you need it, it's there for you. And all this work you're doing way back when you were, do you even remember when you were a junior in college? Way back when you were in junior in college, all that work you were doing, it wasn't just busy work to prevent you from going into the graduate program. It was actually valuable stuff that helps me be successful in my career, right? That's the, that's the hope and the promise of this approach to your education, right? That's good, right? So I hope this website is still there 20 years from now and on your phone and ready to be deployed when you need it. Other questions about the sketch writing? that you just did? Because we're going to do it again. And it's going to become more and more routine. It's just going to become a habit. It's going to be something we don't talk about on Wednesdays so much. We just answer a few questions. And it's, going to be, it's not going to be just for this class. Maybe it'll be something uh, you guys say, hey, everybody, instead of having everybody read this you know, book, why don't we break it up like we did that time with that guy in that class that Sunday? Right? So it becomes part of your toolkit. It's part of your power tools, how you succeed in school and in uh, your career. Is it working? Do you think it's going to work? Is there any way we can make it work better? You'll think about that. Kevin? I would say in terms of format, there's like, it's so heavy on the format that like it kind of becomes hard to like, understand and read um, as like a figure piece that kind of fancy people. Yeah, can it be more like a diagram? Can it be more like an like highlight is not a thing? Like this doesn't this is shouldn't be a separate category. I was thinking, like, because I know typically lots of people when they're when they're doing like fast notes, they tend to do more like bullet points, and that makes things like clear. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Let's do more bullet points. I feel like it is really heavy on format, and I'm like trying to focus on like formatting it correctly versus kind of like the actual content. Yeah, I agree. That's why we have this simple, easy formatting tool. So we don't have to talk about it, think about it, don't have to be distracted. We're just all in agreement. Yeah, maybe this is the wrong formatting, maybe that indent is too heavy. Um, but uh, so what do you suggest? One of the things that I find remarkable and startling, how long is this document? It's almost as, you know, it's too close to being the same length as the readings themselves. We went from 60 pages to 20 pages. It's okay. What would be better than 20 pages, 22 pages? 10 would be better. Right? What would be better than 10? Five, six. You know, there are trade offs with all these things. There are trade offs with going from 22 pages to five pages. You're at risk of missing something, but all of a sudden it becomes more accessible because I can just read it on my way to the meeting and be ready. Right? I can read it on my way to class today and I'm ready. And I'm, I, I can read five pages and nail this in much faster time than reading half of the 22 pages. Oh my God, you know, kill me now. This is taking forever, right? It's probably your experience. There are trade-offs with bullet points. Sometimes we, we reduce things to a bullet-pointed list, and I don't even understand what the point was because it's not a complete sentence. So uh, in, in the pursuit of this function, there are trade-offs, and uh, we as a group can forge uh, a path forward that makes it better. More bullet points, less huge blocks of text. Um, 
instead of 22 pages, let's try to get it to 15 next time. Who's with me? Well, everyone is going through, uh, in this case, uh, half of you went through the 11 pages of the first reading and half of you went through the 11 pages of the second reading. And each of you were forging your own takeaway sentence from that reading that you engaged. And um, increasingly, especially as each of you take turns as editor, uh, you're gonna notice things like, hey, the page location is missing. And so you're gonna take on that role of editor you know, pull your weight, people. Put the page location in there. You can't have a whole paraphrased paragraph without a page location. What if one of us wants to cite it in a footnote at some point in the future? Right? So, yes, people should take care of some of the housekeeping of how to make this document a better document. Other things about this? Okay. Ready to move on to target questions for the reading? Okay. I mean, for the lecture. So, um, before we get into the lecture, what, what should... Uh, what are some of the target questions you guys identified coming out of the reading, going into the lecture, that we need to address in the next, however much time is remaining? We had a question. Um, we asked, do the rapidly urbanizing third world countries use American principles as a roadmap for development, uh, in development, or have they adopted their own? Am I capturing that? Um, yeah, it's not, yeah, pretty small. So. What else? Can you ask why in America? Like, why are we? Uh, why is the American dream so important? Why not? So why are we so special? Other questions? Yeah. Say that again. To what? What's the verb? To eliminate. Is it possible to eliminate the Yeah. How about how can we? Yeah. How can we uh, remove the barriers between The haves and the have nots. Is the American dream viable or is it okay? Does this really have to do with architecture and architects, or is it really just politics? I'm 
loving these questions. That's it? That's pretty good. Wow. Does anyone want to take a shot at any of these before we dig in? Are you okay? Seeing, so can he do it? <clears throat> can he take the lecture that he prepared for today and divert it in ways that addresses these questions? And while we're at it, the eight o'clock group asked the question, how to offer attractive alternatives to the rebundled pockets of exclusion. That's kind of a quote directly from Dick and Rimmer, who is cited in both readings. Rebundling, rebundled pockets of exclusion, luxury enclaves that are bounded by walls and guard posts and razor wire and you know, the have-nots are excluded. Mega projects, how can mega project, how can we test mega projects uh, as we design them to improve their performance? That was one of the questions. Okay. As in how can like mega projects work on the next one? Uh, no. Um, we have the benefit of doing things that are a lot less expensive than the actual mega project. We have sketches, drawings, models, digital models. They're all cheap and easily manipulated. So we can test them out to see if they're gonna do what we want them to do, to see what, what their performance. We try to boost their performance in the design process before it gets built. So how do we, better test the mega projects to improve their performance. It's, you know, that's the heart and soul. Why do you call in an architect? To test the proposal uh, during the design process, to make sure it performs well uh, once it's implemented. That's, that's kind of what makes this architecture more than politics. Okay, we're good. So four parts, uh, and um, I'm gonna try to get through the whole thing uh, because the eight o'clock group didn't get the whole thing. The eight o'clock group got a lot of the Jakarta material. So the reading covers a big chunk, but then there's the larger question of, so what, right? What are the, one of the things we're constantly encountering in architectural practice is uh, why do you make us responsible for uh, climate change? We're just designing buildings. Okay? We can get lead certification. We can make a net zero. We can put solar panels on. We can make it um, sustainable. You know, we can reduce the content of the carbon content of the concrete. <laughs> this, that's what we're trained to do. Why are you making us go beyond that? The building technology part. Um, why does it matter what happens between our project and the site boundaries? Why does it matter how the site boundaries uh, are configured? Why are you making us part of this? That's the government's process. That's their responsibility, not me, the architect. I'm just an architect. Um, so this is an interesting point uh, that I've referred to previously, that in 1970, when the Dutch government said, sorry about the three and a half centuries of colonial oppression as we extracted resources and uh, horribly punished uh, the Javanese and other peoples of Indonesia, sorry about that. Let's make it up to you. Let's give you some planning training. So they sent some trainers to, to help boost the carrying capacity of the Indonesian government. They came up with it and they switched it from a training session to an actual, let's co-produce a plan for the expansion of Jakarta. They, which is often the case in the planning study, 
and looked at three models of potential development for the city of Jakarta. Here's the historic core. The first thing they looked at is, should we do it the way the British did it, with a bunch of satellite towns outside of London in a ring around London and while we preserve a green belt to protect uh, London from sprawling endlessly out. So we could do that, but they, uh, but they said, nah, in terms of the efficiency of infrastructure, this requires you to create ring roads, uh, which is very inefficient. You have to build so many more roads per thousand houses. And if you concentrated on a finger model, this is much more important. Plus, we don't have good zoning controls in Indonesia. People tend to build where they want to build. The government doesn't really, it's not really very effective at preventing people from filling in the, the green space. So this is this was immediately rejected. This is more efficient. You can concentrate your infrastructure developments on these five fingers, and you can prevent development in these uh, preserved green spaces by withholding roads and electricity and water and all of these things. So it discourages uh, people from developing here and encourages them to develop here. Well, if that's a sensible way to do things, then why not take it to the next extreme? Instead of five fingers, let's have three fingers. And let's create a corridor, an east-west corridor along the north coast of Java and put a rail system to connect people here so we can keep people out of cars. Because the Dutch, have you been to Amsterdam? The Dutch. Wow. The Dutch are the best. So this was, they said, basically in chapter one, they said, this is what we should do. It retains, it keeps, uh, preserves this sensitive, uh, the mangrove forest along the coastline that prevents tsunami, uh, it protects against uh, global you know, oceans rising. This having a big catchment area for rainfall, increased rainfall in, in the 21st century. Um, it, will, it will reduce the, the water flowing through the rivers and flooding Jakarta's horrible floods. Um, so this is the best thing. Let's just make a transportation corridor, hopefully mostly based on rail transportation, just to concentrate the necessary development in a compact transit-oriented approach. Sounds good, right? So chapter one is chapter one, all this theory, that's fine. But by the time we get to chapter three, they're basically giving us exactly what they said we shouldn't do. And what they actually build is exactly the thing that they said never, friends don't let friends do. Why did they go to rain roads and lots and lots of roads? Because the president's family is in the business of road construction. And the president's friends and golfing partners are uh, banks that wanted to diversify their holdings using uh, real estate development as a way to grow wealthy and loan themselves money for the development that they actually never do. Jakarta's population is more than Massachusetts' population. By far. The actual population of Jakarta is about 30 million. Second largest city in the world. That's, would you say that's the Americanized? sort of way of developing the city, restructuring? Well, except for, um, no, that's too cynical. I mean, uh, uh, President Biden is not in the road construction business, and Eisenhower, who originally uh, championed the Interstate Highway Act in the 1950s, it wasn't to enrich his family and friends. It was to, it was a defense move so we could move troops quickly to both coasts and it helped the economic development of the country. So as horrible and destructive and harmful as the interstate highway system has been for the United States, it was all with the best of intentions, unlike Indonesia, where it was pure corruption. And subdivisions in the post-war building boom uh, with white flight leaving cities and moving to the suburbs, that was 
well intentioned. No, it was part of uh, racial segregation. But other than the race thing, it was well intended for white people. It was good for white people. You know, the, as long as you add if you're white to the end of every statement, then it's good if you're white. There's better schools if you're white, better housing if you're white. You know, you can have access to your car and you move, go into the city and go to your job if you're white. Right? That's so if you're white, the US system is great if you're white. Here, this doesn't benefit anyone but the handful of maybe a hundred families that uh, were in the banking industry and were able to maximize uh, their profits by pretending to develop new towns. Some of them crazy large. So this is kind of the, the rest of the, the larger implications for what was written about it. And here's just some pictures that go. That's not Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> is that a real thing? Yeah, that's real. Thanks, this. Yeah. Is in some, they, in what started with a K, and then oh. they put a C. What, is that, that's in Jakarta? That's in Jakarta. Is it like positive or satirical? <laughs> They're serious. Oh, oh. Is this only one of those micro, like, neighborhoods? Or just micro enclaves. Yeah, oh. it's a gated community. So we do this in the US. We build subdivisions outside of cities. They're great. And it's, uh, you know, why can't, why should they not do that, right? Why are you so mean? Um, so this is just, the, the architects took the same architecture history courses you took, or I took. So they studied American architecture and they know how to build it. They studied the Arc de Triomphe, they know how to build it. They studied, here's a quick pop quiz, What's this monument from your History 31 course? Brunelleschi's Dome. Yes, Brunelleschi's Dome. In, in what city? Italy. Italy. What city? Florence. Yes, Florence. Give the man a cigar. No, not a cigar. You don't do that. <laughs> Points. You know, so you study architectural history. Oh, so it's like Vegas. You say, oh, this isn't right. This, this is, is, is the Roman Colosseum. And the Greek Acropolis, they're on either side of the, the Aegean Sea. I mean, it's different. Why are they all of a sudden in the same place? Jakarta? Yeah. Oh. They're just throwing stuff up to throw stuff up? Not to throw stuff up, to offer a better lifestyle for the wealthy. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't. The wealthiest 5%. I don't get throwing up a, a model of the Colosseum as is today. With, basically unusable like why would you throw the wall you're fired i'm good <laughs> next you know we we hire the architects who are okay making these simulacra that's insane it's insane thank you it's just a waste of money it's a really good investment he's fired yeah you can't listen to me <laughs> he's fired until he comes around and then he's the boss said Listen, it's just for the wealthiest 5%. It's not going to do any harm. This is what they want. You give the people what they want. This is market demand. We want to live in a place where instead of flying to the great cities around the world, we live in the great cities around the world. Osaka. I mean, not Osaka. You say shrine. So in this scenario, so it's, it's, we know how to collage things in Photoshop. You, so even down to you know right off out of off the TV. So why why the U.S. right? Because the U.S. is the beacon. The U.S. is the reference point for everyone. If you want to know, if you are a kid in Bangladesh or India. Uh, or Africa, or anywhere where you have to, you're struggling, like you, you're you going to school, you want to go to college, you want to have a good information technology job, you want to, you know, what's your future going to be? You, the building blocks of the future that you are constructing for yourself, those building blocks 
are served up to me on a daily basis on TV, in the movies, music, advertising, TikTok. That's how I envision my future. And for a while, I was make, giving lectures at universities in Southeast Asia and Asia. And um, I would ask the audience, okay, uh, in college students, how many of you drove here today? You know, raise your hand. How many of you drove here? Um, uh, and in Indonesia, I would say, I'd, be, I'd clarify, how many of you came on a motorbike? You know, and it's like, everyone raises their hands. And five years from now, when you've graduated and you're working as an architect, how many of you will be still getting around on a motorbike? How many of you will have a car? <laughs> everyone how many of you will live in a house like this how many of you, you know, just on and on done how many of you will have a refrigerator at the time when nobody had a refrigerator why would you need a refrigerator you go to the market you buy your food you cook it you eat it and tomorrow you go to the market you get your food why how many of you have a washing machine how many of you you know and so the building blocks of my future success are constructed out of my image consumption from TV, TikTok, uh, music video, advertising, et cetera. That's why the US. Um, Rodeo Drive, which is a famous place. Maybe we can close this. Yes, can you guys close this? Show? Might pop a little bit. So, I'm always bicycling just to see the world. So I'm bicycling outside of uh, the city and I'm, I wanna talk to people who live here. So I come here, this is a new, at the time, newish real estate extension of the city. I see a guy, I talk to him, I should take a photograph of him, shouldn't I? Anyway, turns out, I say, so do you live here? And he says, no, 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 I'm the gardener. He said, um, well, who lives here? And he said, well, I do. So you do live here. Um, well, I spend the night sometimes just as a watchman. And it turns out there's three or four people who work for the families that own these homes. They keep, them, you know, keep the gardening looking good. They, they, they sweep every day. And someone sleeps there at night. So People don't break in and steal the copper wires and copper pipes. So they're just caretaking the houses. No one's living there. It turns out that when the family had a baby, they bought a house. When the family had another baby, they bought a second house. And when those babies are ready to get married, the plan is they sell the house, having never lived in it. No one ever rented it. No one actually ever occupied it as you would expect a house to be occupied. They sell it, use the money to set up the, new, the young couple, pay for their wedding, their honeymoon, a new place for them to live, which no one wants to live out here. It's in the middle of nowhere. Why would anyone want to live out here? This is just investment property. No one lives here. So we talked about this before, the financialization, Dubai, one Dalton place, the darkness of the windows in the evenings. Have you been checking that out? Is it dark? Take some photos. This is part of the research. Gated communities, the bundling. So zoning, we're gonna talk about zoning as the rationale for zoning has to do with um, the number one principle in planning is don't shit where you eat. Sorry for the technical language. Um, there's a big stinking smokestack and a pipe sending pollution into the river. Don't put your house there. Don't put your daycare center there. Put a buffer zone and then you put a neighborhood of houses. And while we're at it, that separate the houses from the commercial center. And so zoning 
started to segregate spaces of American cities uh, artificially, where normally uh, you would have corner store, a laundromat, houses, you know, it's going to be the symbiotic walking distance relationship between the coffee shop and where people live. Uh, zoning was part of that uh, separation of, of single use zones that make it so you can't walk there. So that the average number of household uh, trips in a Florida home uh, in recent decades, something like 27. And how many of those are taken by car? 27. Uh, if you need a loaf of bread, what do you do? You get in the car. If you need to visit a friend, what do you do? You get in the car, et cetera. Maybe that's changed with Zoom, but it's basically part of that uh, automobile dependency is the byproduct of zoning. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. But then what the readings this week were all pointing at, uh, and this is Dick and Rimmer's uh, research, he said um, these zones of exclusion, these privileged services are being bundled. There's a separate gated community luxury enclave bundled and then this, uh, all these commercial, recreational, um, and uh, employment centers bundled uh, in the on the outside ring around the central city, and then these are the zones of exclusion, excluding everyone from these zones. And so this is a diagram of uh, the emerging city logic. Here's uh, a chunk of that city logic where this is Jakarta, where the neighborhoods where people live, uh, school, um, maybe government office, and another chunk in here in the center that hasn't been transformed yet. And then here's the ring road and the office towers, big parking lots, lots of open space. Um, these people used to be able to walk to the road and catch a bus. Do you think they can now? No, the whole point is to exclude them. And so when we do our analyses, we don't just look at the architecture. We also look at the relationship between the site and the surrounding context. If this is the relationship, if this is the architecture of that boundary, it's a very different architectural outcome than if it's permeated. So we see uh, the residential neighborhoods of Jakarta are being carved away to make room for these condo towers um, under construction and already occupied or at least owned. And then these islands of exclusion are starting to become the interlinked archipelago and these enclaves of the original residential fabric are increasingly uh, being made as islands. And so this is how things are going in a lot of the cities we're talking about. And just the final thing in Jakarta, um, that the chapter, the title Orange County Java was published in 2002. And then in 2016, we have Orange County Java being marketed uh, as a new town proposal, never built, but proposed. So all of these things that we see uh, having all of these detrimental impacts in Indonesia, uh, and by the way, it, it basically is a huge property bubble. These new towns were not built. These new towns were not needed. These new towns that were subsidized by government programs to help ease the affordability, housing affordability crisis, uh, instead of benefiting uh, the majority of Jakartans, it actually became the investment property of the wealthiest 5% of the population. So the government tax revenue is going to subsidize all of this housing that does nothing to ease the affordability crisis and actually makes it much worse 
and it only benefits the wealthiest 5% and not as, uh, as homes, but as investments. So it backfired, even though they had this wonderful law that said for every luxury home you build, you must build nine other uh, market you know, uh, for middle and low income households. That was a law. How many times did that happen? Once. A friend of mine uh, actually executed that. But every other architect, every other development, every other project uh, found a way to not do it. So it was called the 136 program. One luxury, three uh, middle income, and six low income house, uh, houses had to be built within the same complex. It just happened once. For everyone else, they paid, uh, they paid money instead of building the housing. They paid for someone to build those other nine units somewhere else that maybe got built, maybe didn't. In the end, the ratio, according to the reading, was more like one to one. And even that one low income house was probably not built. It was you know, just, and if it was built, it was built way far away. So it created a property bubble that burst in 1997, resulting in the Southeast Asian economic crisis that resulted in Suharto being swept out of uh, office and a whole new uh, era for Indonesia and other countries in Southeast Asia. So as, as consequential as all this is when it happened in Indonesia, it's kind of nothing compared with what then happened in China. China is where it really uh, is so visible. What's going on with China? Why is it so important for China to become a superpower and dominate the world? because they were humiliated in the 19th century. Did we talk about this in history theory too? So um, China was never formally colonized, but they were economically dominated and they did lose control of Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, and a few other key regions. British are famous for drinking tea. Yes. And where do we get that to? India, China. 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 And uh, what do we do when China says, we'll sell you tea, but you have to have something we want? And Britain had nothing Ch the Chinese wanted. You know, all this industrial development in the mid 19th century, we don't care. We don't need any of that. We have the greatest fill in the blank. We've got the best. Uh, textiles, we've got the best clothing, we've got the best porcelain, that's why it's called China. We've got the best, you name it, we got the best. We're not interested in anything you have to offer us food. So what are you supposed to do if you're Britain and you want to drink tea? To, to grow tea? That's, that's actually, why, why didn't you say that then? What did they actually do instead? They exploited a local uh, resource to uh, destabilize China. Well, not in order to destabilize China. They wanted China to purchase what they were offering uh, from the British. So the British would have something that they could use to purchase the tea. That's what they wanted. They wanted China to be going great. Um, but they did what we used to do, if you're white, uh, back in the colonial period, is, you know, what else? it's illogical, it's just rational. You, the obvious thing to do is to grow opium in India, sell it to the Chinese population, get them addicted, uh, destroying the fabric of their society, and then use that money to buy your tea. It's just rational, it just makes sense. If all you care about is extractive capitalism and tea, it's just, just what you do. That's the system. I'm just doing, I'm just, you know, you're telling me that uh, I will be rewarded if I play by the rules. 
I'm just playing by the rules. It's rational, it's a normal thing to do. Just sell opium to the Chinese and everything's great. Are you serious? That was the mindset. I'm trying to access the mindset of the colonial logic of this because it's familiar, right? Fast forward to 2022, you have a head of Exxon Mobil. You, the, there's going to be the dolphin historians are going to sit in the classroom a thousand years from now, and they're going to give the same lecture. Only the dolphin historians are going to say, this is what the, uh, those two-legged mammals did in China. And then this is what the two-legged mammals did in the United States, uh, ExxonMobil. We're following the same logic that this species of mammal had developed. They were playing by the rules. Whoever extracts the most petroleum and dumps the most carbon into the atmosphere, uh, the fastest wins. Those are the rules of the game. And so if those are the rules of the game, climate change is the outcome. It's just simple. It's just how the rules of the game are played. The rules of the game at this point was whoever sells the most opium to the Chinese gets the most tea, they win. You become a member of parliament and maybe prime minister. Right? You will be rewarded. The more opium you sell, the more we will reward you. That's the system. Don't be surprised if the outcome is a lot of opium in China. That's what I'm saying. I think it's horrible, but I'm sure the people who were winning and became members of parliament because they sold the most opium are probably nice people. It's not because they're mean. They're just playing by the rules of the game. If you want to change the outcome, change the rules. And the rules are embedded in architecture. So if you want to change the outcomes, change the blueprint for the future. The U.S., is writing the blueprint. The US is the designer of the future of everyone in the world. If you wanna change the outcome, change what we do here in the US, make it prestigious to do the right thing. So the Chinese uh, confiscated a boatload of opium. The British said, act of war, they sent their navy in, they devastated uh, the port cities of China and took over, their reward was they divided up, the European powers divided up Shanghai into a series of concessions. We still talk about the international concession, the French concession in Shanghai, uh, in, as opposed to the Chinese city. The Huangpu River became a major port for European extraction out of China. And the architecture of that port was from the US. US architects, US builders, building the waterfront of the Bund in Shanghai for the international European powers to use it as a base of extracting the wealth of China for shipment overseas. This humiliation um, of China resulted in uh, Shanghai being quite similar what kind of a replica of the skyline in Manhattan. Um, fast forward to 1979, Mao Zedong, who uh, had a very tight control over cities and wanted the population of China to disperse across the countryside. If we needed to smell steel, we would do it in the backyards of villagers. Uh, we wouldn't do it in cities. So, Shanghai kind of just got preserved. Here's the bones and all those American buildings. Um, but then in 1979, when Mao dies, Deng Xiaoping uh, becomes the premier of China. He says, let's embrace capitalism with communist attributes. So it's a state-controlled capitalism. And they said, we are done with the humiliation of the 19th century, of the opium wars we are going to take our rightful place on the global stage as a superpower. Here we are with them threatening to take Taiwan um, and having a reasonable shot 
at winning any military conflict with the United States over Taiwan. It's working. But how did they get to this? Deng Xiaoping said, yes, New York, London, Tokyo are the three global centers of capitalism. We want to add a fourth in China. So what are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Call the architects. Right? You see Ghostbusters? You had to. You had to, right? That's the call and response. But who are you going to call? The architects in this case. So they have an international competition. And the architects say, so what would you like? I've got something here that is a Manhattan. Do you like a Manhattan? That's what it would look like. Or I can also offer you Venice. Would you like a Venice? <laughs> or how about a Paris? We have a, Par we have a Paris. We can give you a Paris. We have one in your size. <laughs> and so this is the, what architects do to figure out how to create a global city, uh, a new global center of capitalism in China. And so they take, they have this competition, you know, I think that's Richard Rogers, SLM, uh, some French guy, can't remember, doesn't matter. So these are the finalists of the international competition for the design of the new global capital of capitalism in China. Um, the Chinese team says, thank you, everybody. They take these ideas, they collage them together, they take the tower from Berlin. They take the Champs Elysees, make it one meter wider than the Champs Elysees. We outdid Paris. Thank you very much. We take Manhattan skyscrapers and we supersize them. So many of the tallest, like eight of the 20 tallest buildings in the world, are right there. And uh, and then off we go. But now what? No one wants to live there, no one wants to work there, but we're opening up China to the markets of the world. And we say, hey, Amazon, you want access to Chinese markets? Hey, Palm Olive, you know, Procter & Gamble, and Nabisco, you want access to Chinese markets? Let's talk. We'll give you access to the Chinese markets. Uh, we just want you to lease 6,000 square meters of office space in our new city. And they said, done. They sign the contracts, they get access to Chinese markets, and they move their headquarters to downtown Shanghai because no one wants to live or work in Pudong. So if you wanted to go practice architecture in Shanghai, you could probably find a really cheap place to live over here because no one wants to live here. Um, but here we are 20 years later after this city was completed, slowly but surely it's starting to fill up. And this is the new city uh, of Fudong across the river from the old city. This is too opaque, so we can't look at it anymore. But um, but this is an interesting photo. Who do we know that does landscape design on the Wentworth Fragment? Oh, wow. Well, that's their competition winning design. But if you ask Mark, is that your design? So, well, we won the competition, but they implemented it in a way that diverges totally from what we designed. So, Yes, no, not really. Uh, it's not ours. Don't blame us for this. But that's what happens in China. The competition for Pudong, is that SOMs? No, but there are SOM ideas there. Uh, the Opera House by Zaha Hadi, is that her Opera House? Kind of. How about the replica of it in the other Chinese city? No. It's, it's the same shape, it looks the same, but it's not a Zaha Hadid project. So this is how practice in China works. Um, in a supercharged version of the Simulacra theme park subdivision development that we saw in Indonesia, outside of Shanghai, we see multiple suburban 
um, residential new towns that are get bought up as investment property, but no one lives there. What is going on here then? Turns out that we're getting married next month and uh, we would love to fly to London and have our photo shoot there, but we don't need to. We can just go to Thamestown, the replica of San Alacro of London. Um, this shop is where the photographer, it's not really a gallery, it's where the photographer can set up the equipment. And this shop, it's not really uh, whatever it's supposed to be. It's uh, where the bride uh, can put on her gown and get makeup done, et cetera. And so at any given time on a weekend uh, to the present, it's, you have to find a location that's not already occupied and you can have your wedding party. That's, that's in the end what's happening to Thamestown. Um, and you've heard about China. And you've heard about it's the largest migration of humans, you know, despite all the war and famine and displacement, refugees uh, all over the world being displaced. China is the largest movement of humans in global history ever. They're moving off the countryside and into these new cities. Uh, they're buying these units on credit and they are signing up for electricity and then they're buying washing machines and ovens and TVs and refrigerators, but then they can't afford the monthly electricity bill. So they're cutting off the electricity and they're doing their laundry in the drainage canals. Uh, instead of going to the grocery store down the street, they're growing food in gardens and they're catching fish in the drainage canal. Is there demand? Kind of. There's demand for this as an investment property. There's demand by local governments to mobilize capital so that this agricultural land that was worth one dollar per hectare is now. You can tell the story that it's going to be sold for $1,000 a hectare or $10,000 a hectare. Um, and that difference can be captured in the credit. So you're actually borrowing money against the present value of the land. Even if the present value of the land arguably is zero and no one wants to live here. But you can tell the story. It's, it's a city. It's a modern new city. And so you tell the story, it's actually worth ten thousand dollars per hectare. You borrow money, and all of a sudden, you've got enormous wealth. There's increasing evidence that the wealth of China. Ghost cities in China have it all, such as lakes, parks, city squares, streetlights, and sprawling road networks. But it is missing one crucial element. Property the people. Some ghost cities were demolished. The second phase of Li Yang New City had been suspended for seven years. It was demolished by blasting on August 27, 2021, and 15 unfinished buildings were blown up within 45 seconds. Oops, Taiwan News said that the value of these structures is around 1 billion it's yuan, worth, or $154 million. Dollars. The housing project began in 2011, and it saw frequent interruptions even after ownership changed. Finally, it was destroyed. However, this isn't the first time China has seen simultaneous demolitions of this size. On August 4, 2017, 36 high-rise buildings in Chenzhai were demolished by centralized blasting, consuming 2.5 tons of explosives. This was also the most extensive blasting in the history of Zhengzhou. There are two government motives for creating ghost cities in China. First, Chinese local governments used real estate developments to boost the local economy. According to a research by Open Edition Journals published in 2017, the residential real estate sector has replaced the manufacturing industry. 
becoming the driving force of the local Real economies. Harvard professor of public policy of and economics, economy, Kenneth Rogoff, and IMF economist Yuan so Chen Yang published research in 2020. The report estimated that the real estate sector accounts for about 29% of China's gross domestic product. Therefore, residential and commercial land expands quicker than housing demand. According to Nikkei Asia, many wealthy people own numerous homes in cities, and the apparent rate of homeownership is over 90%. It was higher than in the most developed country. It's definitely a waste of material. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a way of creating, uh, of correcting the oversupply problem. And not, it's a huge oversupply, huge oversupply of investment properties. Um, even larger oversupply in terms of housing because no one wants to live there. There's no reason for anyone to live here. There's nothing there. But were these those to be created to actually supply housing? Here I or was it specifically for the investment? It's first and foremost investment for the first 20 years and okay. investment. With the slight promise, there is a story to prop up the, the investment idea, the possibility that in 20 or 30 years, there will actually be actual demand for housing. But if you admit that there's never going to be demand for housing, then the bubble bursts and the Chinese economy collapses. In the last few weeks and months, it appears that the Chinese economy is collapsing which um, I want to get to this point. Here I put life expectancy at birth from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here or have they got longer lives and live up there let's see we stop the world and this is all un statistic that has been available here we go can you see there it's china they're moving against better health they're improving there all the green latin american countries they are moving towards smaller families your yellow ones here are the arabic countries and they get larger families but they no longer life but not larger families the africans are the green down here they still remain here this is india indonesia is moving on pretty fast and in the 80s here you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. <laughs> Let me make a comparison directly between the United States of America and Vietnam, 1964. America had small families and long lives, Vietnam had large families and short lives, and this is what happened. The data... We don't have time for that. So if you look at... If you look yes, at the average data country, of the countries, they are like this. Now, that's dangerous to use average data because there's such a lot of difference within countries. So if I go and look here, we can see that Uganda, that today is where South Korea was 1960. If I split Uganda, there's quite a difference within Uganda. These are the quintiles of Uganda. The richest 20% of Ugandans are there. The poorest are down there. If I split South Africa, it's like this. And if I go down and look at Niger, where there was such a terrible famine, lastly, it's like this. The 20% poorest of Niger is out here and the 20% richest of South Africa is there. And yet 
we That's tend to discuss on what solutions there should be in Africa. Africa. Everything in this world exists in Africa. World, and you can't discuss up. universal now, access to HIV for that quintile up here world, with the same strategy now, as down, down here. The improvement of the world must be highly contextualized. And it's not relevant to have it on regional level. We must be much more detailed. Welcome to life in the United States in the 21st century. We have the third world right here out the window. People are talking a lot about inequality these days. And so um, this is kind of, uh, if we have a few seconds or look at the world slide. population is expected to reach about 9 billion by 2050. Answers the question. Eighty-six percent of this, in other words, almost eight billion people, will be in the developing world. The thing is, the actual number of people is not in itself an issue, except in some very densely settled countries. In fact, you could fit the entire population of the world into the state of Texas, although not very comfortably. In world population terms, what really matters is a simple ratio, 32 to 1. It represents consumption. This is where our problems begin. The average rates at which we consume resources, such as oil and metals, and produce waste, like plastic and greenhouse gases, are about 32 times higher in North America, Western Europe, Japan and Australia than they are in the developing world. 32 to 1 captures the difference in consumption between the first world and the third world. This little ratio has huge consequences. Let me explain. The estimated 1 billion people who live in the developed world have a relative per capita consumption rate of 32. Most of the world's other 5.5 billion people in the developing world have a rate well below 32, mostly near to 1. This means that with 10 times the population, the United States consumes 320 times more resources than, for example, Kenya does. The poor of the world logically want to have our standards of living. But the fact is that the planet simply does not have sufficient resources to support such a dream. And so, we're left with a fundamental problem. What's the problem? If the whole developing world were to catch up with us, world consumption rates would increase 11-fold. It would be as if the world had a population of 72 billion people. We may see China's growing consumption as a problem, but the Chinese and many, many others are only reaching for the consumption rate we already have. Telling them they cannot or should not try would be hypocritical, immoral, self-serving, and futile as it wouldn't work. What we should be trying to do is to make consumption rates and living standards more equal around the world and to do it at a level the planet can sustain. Okay. The question is, how can we do this? I think what we're looking for is those edge conditions around beautiful architecture like the thing we saw in Rio, right? Or was that Sao Paulo, Parasopolis? Uh, that luxury condo tower with the spiral terraces and the pools, and then the guarded wall and the home zone. That's, that's Sao Paulo. So like a, like a landscape we're looking for? We're looking for beautiful architecture, the edge condition, and how that beautiful architecture is really messing things up. Or the surrounding uh, community. Anywhere. How do we what? How do you do a search? Yeah. yeah. Terms. No, there's no key term for that. Maybe you should look at China. Maybe you should look at Sao Paulo, Parasopolis in Sao Paulo, Jakarta, Shanghai, Rio. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So my image is crazy. Yeah. It's not. I put 
the people from another image oh. because I wanted to have that way. Yeah, I mean, you're allowed to do that, right? No. We're not. We're trying to no. learn. Um, okay. So it is, so that makes it kind of a learning. Yeah, because I added a few. Yeah, look at them. They're so close. They're beautiful mm -hmm. people. They're models. Yeah, but this, uh, yeah. yeah. The people that I got is from like another image yeah. from the same object. Okay. But this is a real picture in yes. real life. Okay. Yes. And then. So my question stands. I don't. Did you lose points for that? I don't think so. I, I think I did because you can't. Photo or renting? Is it just that like people are? Yeah. Oh yes, I think you lost one point. Yeah. But it wasn't just for that. It was also because we don't have access to the ground plane. Yeah. How am I supposed to have it? The photos. I could. There are no photos. Find, I couldn't find the photo. Yeah, I couldn't find it. Yeah. So if it's can, hard. If we can't find a picture of a project, yeah. should we just like do another one and not? That's a trade off. I mean, because I really we, couldn't. We really appreciate the analysis you did with that photo. We really appreciate it. Just, you know, it's nothing personal. No, it, you know, yeah. it's just, it's not a punishment. It's not, it's just the image itself is not for the court. Yeah. Okay. And then, you asked, are these family courtyards or shared among the residents and all of that? And I explained in my, in here. So, like, the affordable community features, like, explaining the roads and the courtyards. Mm -hmm. So, like, is that not clear? Like, how can I change? Like, make well, you better? can say it, but the Missouri rules part. What makes you think that that's the case? That that's a common courtyard? Yeah. Um, right? Yeah. And wait, you got four, you got three out of four for that part of it, I suspect. For yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's not impersonal, again. Yeah. And it's understandable that. I don't know what, what do you want me to do fly there that would be unreasonable um on a, in a more successful project we can actually see uh we have access to enough of the form that we can make a reasonable judgment that these are private or shared or public or, or something and then judge it and interpret it accordingly and this is going to be, this project is fascinating for when we get to week three. Okay. Because we're going to look at the rules of Islam mm -hmm. and how it uh, directly translates into architecture. Okay. And what do you mean by the precision and impact? Because that was my lowest. Um, like, how can I be better? Yeah. Let's look at the image. Um, it's not like, a, like overall, like everything. It's um, it's looking at enough of the elements, like um, zooming in and uh, not just capturing the openings, but these kind of shroud elements around each window. Instead of making every building the same color, are there differentiations? Why are some why is that wall blank? And so, uh, what can be learned here? What are these? And why do they look the way they look? It's like an interrogation of the details. Well, like exploring more. Like, A deeper the, interrogation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, I found a website, Basala um, Surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, for stuff and actually really useful, it's called Unequal Scenes. And oh, yeah, Unequal Scenes is great. Yeah, so basically, it has different cities around the world. So, this is in but out of bounds, don't use these images. Oh, yeah. Go to these locations and get other images that, like, that give us access to the architectural experience and foreground the larger pattern. Awesome, especially all these locations in that. Yeah, especially if you can get down to the level and be able to judge the way the boundaries are very
It might have been on the same time. Okay. Okay. Stop the recording. So, other questions? Um, yes. So, for my analysis, mm -hmm. I feel like I, I thought I was doing it.